<laughs> Hello everyone and welcome to Magma Rages episode 59. Uh, we're back again after being terrible and missing last week. Uh, <laughs> but we're back again and um, yeah, we're joined once again by Pandemonia. And we've got a couple things to discuss this week as we'll go uh, into detail on some more um meta decks right now some some interesting decks some tips on how to play them uh we've also got of course the magma rages uh tip to keep you from raging we're going to be talking about planning ahead uh in terms of you know your turns and how, how you plan ahead for the rest of the game um obviously we've got some news uh, taverns of time the new arena event that's happening um and there's choose your champion that just went live today i believe uh, and then, of course, we've got our usual esports um, section where we'll talk about HTTC All, um, DreamHack Summer, and the uh, upcoming um, Rush event here in South Africa in Pretoria this year, I think. Yep. Um, okay, so let's get back to the news. Let's start there. So, Taverns of Time is the new event which is launched. Um, it's been going for a little bit now. I think both of us have played maybe a little, like, I think I have two in progress arena runs um I, I i i i like that they are doing events i'm not super sold on the events being um in arena like i, I don't know if it's always the best approach i feel like for hardcore arena players maybe it ruins their experience a little bit i don't know yeah uh, i mean having events is, uh, as, uh, i think we just need more events honestly i mean if you look at uh, not to mention the other blizzard games as well as the other yeah um, just other games as a whole uh, how many events those things have I mean yeah. it's cool I mean it would be really cool to start seeing more uh, like stuff like, like I, I mean I, I, it might be difficult to implement in Hearthstone but you know like in other games you have limited edition skins or you have like extra art things to collect or something you want some cosmetic reasons to play these events right uh, I mean maybe cosmetic or maybe it's easter eggs or maybe you, you collect you collect something silly you know like uh, for those of you who use Steam, you know, there was a badge thing where you collected random badges. Like, it, it doesn't, it just adds a little bit of fun novelty to it. You know, it doesn't sure. actually affect the game or the program in any way. But, yeah, I mean, I'm yeah. glad they're doing it. I mean, yeah, I, I, to a certain extent, they might be limited by implementation reasons for, uh, like, Hearthstone as well. But, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, with this event, we get new cards. There's, um, I think there's, 28 cards, uh, yeah, two per class, uh, two class cards, and uh, 10 neutral cards. Um, we're not going to go over all the cards here um, because we're not an arena-focused um, podcast. But uh, what I do think is really interesting is that they seem to be experimenting with some new mechanics. This whole like deck manipulation thing is something that they're mm. experimenting with, which I think is quite interesting. You know, we have the whole like discover a card, put it on top of your deck. Um, obviously, it costs less I as well, but think like yeah, um, it, it seems like they might be kind of hinting at maybe or testing things for the yeah. future. Yeah, I, I was about to say for me, it kind of feels like they're using arena now, sort of as a, a like kind of a beta testing ground in terms of seeing how certain like ideas interact, like in terms of how certain mechanics or concepts mm. interact. So, like you say, you know, cards drawn, or you know, like. The, the the dragon that you know stays dormant or cards where they mm. start putting cards from different sets into your hand or like like rearranging your deck so maybe we could you know see more card like you know these mechanics slowly be introduced into like constructed cards and you know sets. yeah I, I feel like the whole cards from the past thing is more specific to the theme of this event being that yeah. it's taverns of time i i personally hope we don't get more cards like that um just because yeah. when they are good they're a little bit too good um but they've had a lot more of this like things being in your effect in your deck having an effect if you know what i mean so like with chromie it's when the cards are drawn they get cast um so yeah. that adds another like interesting you know we've seen that with like um Felderai strider and um deck of wonders i mean those are the, the two obvious examples i can think of that are like that and, and then we've also got like the cards that have maybe smaller bonus effects when you draw them like the uh, elemental that adds a random class card to your hand uh or the dragon the paladin dragon that gives you a one one um as well as having that like whole infinite thing that they've got going on um 
where the, the minion kind of, you play it and it shuffles another one into your deck, if you know what I yeah. mean. Yeah. That, that could um, be a little bit more dangerous in like constructed. Yeah, where you can that is very purposefully <laughs> always put two in your deck and mulligan for like infinite murlocs, for example. But I mean, I think it's just an idea that they're in. Yeah. Know, and, and, and some of these ideas I think are really interesting. I mean, I don't know, do you have a favorite card? Do you have a favorite mechanic? Uh, obviously, I, I like the discover ones because of value. I mean, the one that obviously I might be biased because I like Warrior is the Warrior Weapon where you can see the the whole concept basically from other games. In Magic, they call it exiling. Yeah. But like like uh, Fake Cleaver, after this kills a minion, destroy all copies of it wherever they are. Yeah. You know, so like, I, I, I think that's an interesting, uh, I find that quite a interesting idea that they're playing with. And then also... Yeah. A way of actually uh, removing stuff from the like dead zone that we have that you know <laughs> that it, that affects cards like Witching Hour and Hadronox and these kind of things. Uh, well, it says after it kills a minion, destroy all copies of it. So I'm a, I think it would take it out of the graveyard. It takes it, it definitely takes it out of the deck and the hand. Uh, but I, I'm, does I, it I don't exactly take it out of the word. graveyard? I, I'm actually not sure. It just says wherever they are. So I would assume I would. You yeah, know, I would like. It's the to copies it. part that makes me think that that's not the case because a card doesn't it's not like you put a copy of it into your grave i don't know but yeah. yeah i mean having a like yeah destroying cards that could be in your opponent's hand or deck for instance is an interesting concept i mean yeah. we see that with like skulking geist in in the actual yeah. um, exactly. constructor cards but yeah yeah, I mean, for me, I think uh, the whole putting cards on top of your deck, uh, the whole ability to actually uh, manipulate what is on top of your deck is interesting because, mm -hmm. you know, there is currently a little bit of counterplay to that from your opponent's side in that um, Gnome Feratu being the <laughs> obvious <laughs> case of, a, yeah. of kind of removing the card on top of your opponent's deck. And it, it would make a little bit more nuance to Gnome Feratu, for instance, and, and how it's played. Um, you would play it like after play after they play that thing, right? And then there could be a bit of chicken there. Like, do you discover something knowing that it might get known for Artude anyway? Like, yeah. I, I don't know, depending on the the effects. I, I mean, I think the actual implementations of a lot of these cards are a little bit too powerful to to ever really be like seen exactly in standard. But uh, I I think the concept's interesting. The whole yeah, that whole discover and put it on top of your deck, I think, is quite cool because it it kind of falls alongside our like tip for this week which is planning ahead right you need to not <laughs> only figure out what spell is good to have on your deck you need to figure out what is the board state going to be like in a turn's time when you are actually going to get that spell right and then you need to figure out as well like um do i do i need to play this now or is there other cards i need from my deck uh more than um some like extra other spell or something that I discovered. And, I, and that's kind of, I think, really interesting. It has a whole well. new angle to it and a whole new angle to planning, I think, which is yeah, good. Much yeah. like Discovered did, I think, in a similar way. Yeah. And I mean, in that case, in that card specifically, it was a combination. But I mean, there could be lots of other ways that it, it, it works um, mm. with other uh, minions. I think it's, or minions or cards, you know, whatever it is, uh, just anything that kind of puts things on top of your deck can be kind of interesting. Um Obviously, there's also a bunch of new quests. Uh, I didn't even know this was a thing until all of a sudden my quests had dust attached to them too. I and, mean, the, and most of them are higher earning yeah. than normal as well. Yeah, a, a, yeah. So there's existing quests, and then there's also new new quests um, like play three dragons and stuff like that. All of them uh, are new quests, actually. Oh, can you only get new quests now? You can only get the new ones. So uh, I haven't even been noticing. It's like it's like take a but it's like the, some of them will take turns, draw cards, play spells, play okay, dragons, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then like play minions that cost one. That's basically all of them in some form. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I get it. Some of them are like themed, right? Like take turns is great because I can just play whatever deck I want. <laughs> yeah, these are a lot easier. I think besides the dragons and the one mana, the one cost co uh, minions. Yeah. The rest, I mean. Drawing cards, playing spells, and taking turns are, are usually what you're doing in Hearthstone a lot of the times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I do have specific decks that when I want to finish them really fast, and like my no, account, I'll, you know. I'll play them. But you know, like um, my um, weapon priest that does both spells <laughs> and taking and drawing cards very well, considering I have like fatigue myself by like turn 
you know, 10 probably of you sleep fatigue <laughs> myself <laughs> um, yeah. if I want to go all out to complete the quest. But anyway, um, yes. you also get a free arena ticket. So if you haven't tried the arena, make sure you go ahead and try it. Yeah. Uh, our tip is for arena is basically just going to be draft the new cards, A, because they're fun to play with, and B, because most of them are pretty good. Yeah, most um, of them are really good. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> I mean, I'm not a fan of Infinite Murloc. That's the only one I keep passing up because I can't p guarantee I'm going to get three for my deck. Um, but... I mean, most of the cards are pretty good. There's some of the class cards that are a little bit iffy, but hell, you know, go ahead and draft them and, and see what they're like, I think. I mean, that's the point of this um, event. Yeah. Um, okay, and then moving on to the actual kind of constructed meta. Um, we have two decks that we're going to talk about today. We haven't really had much of a... Uh, had many episodes since the the patch launched so we're going to be talking about some of the most prominent decks post the the patch meta uh and we're going to be starting off with even warlock um so this is a deck that we've both played quite a lot of but i think you've also um uh played a, a lot of it recently and you know you're a big fan of uh tapping into mountain giants right yeah, so, I mean, basically, as, a, as quite a lot of people have said, this deck kind of, it's a big, basically, it's a big, it's a, it's a kind of a flashback to the original handlock days, uh, because, you know, part of the power of this deck is that when you're on the coin, and you have Mountain Giant, you can play Mountain Giant on turn three, by just going laugh tap, turn one, turn two, laugh tap, turn three, play three mana giants, and, yeah. and then that's part of the strength of the deck, not to mention, obviously, playing a big Twilight Drake. Uh, the, the deck, it's quite a, it's not as slow and controlly sort of as the old handlock. It's a lot more of a, I mean, even though it has cards like Doomsayer, I, I think I consider it more of a mid-range deck. It's, yeah, it's like a, fair. it's more of a mid-range deck with mid, mid, mid-sized dudes. You know, mm. it's got, obviously you've got Mountain Giants, you've got Twilight Drakes, you've got Hooked Reavers, which is also... A card that is, uh, you know, four mana seven seven. Uh, yeah, and I, I think that the great thing that Hooked Reaver reminds me of is, it, it, in many matchups and in mirrors and stuff, it, it is very much a case of like playing against this deck and playing with the deck. How do you manipulate your life to get it below that like key target of fifteen, which is reminiscent of the old handlock and molten giant days, right? Yeah, exactly. When they were like the key life total uh, numbers, and maybe you want to save your healing for after you play your hooked reaver, depending on your matchups. So, um, I think it can be pretty interesting as to how you use the hooked reavers as well. So, th so that's another thing that I think gives it a little bit of that uh, like handlock um, nostalgia. Yeah. Not to mention even further more than the nostalgia is the fact that you're running Shroom Brewers. Uh, it's basically like sort of obviously uh, upgraded Earthen Ring Fast here. So, you sure. know, it's got it's got the same sort of similar interactions where, you you know, you can heal up your giants and things again. Yeah. You know, and, and those sort of things. So, all around, I think it's quite a solid deck. Uh, it yeah. is one of those decks, though, that even though it runs Blood Reaver Gul'dan, it doesn't get as much benefit, obviously, than Q-Block does. That's obviously the thing to note, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the things is that the only taunts you really bring back are Volga Homunculuses. Yeah. Uh, or Homunculi. Homunculi. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's because, obviously, Hooked Reaver doesn't come back as a taunt, which is pretty important. Yeah. Uh, I think it would actually be a massive buff to this deck if Hooked Reaver had taunt naturally, but that's another story. Um, oh, wow, well, yeah. And I mean, Dread Infernal is actually pretty good. One of the interesting things and one of the things to remember about Dread Infernal is because it damages you as well, it also activates your spellstone. Yeah. Uh, and that's an important thing to remember. It helps a lot against like Odd Paladin in particular. That's pretty much the deck it shines against the most. Um, yeah. And, I mean, even Warlock generally does well against those kind of board floody decks because you have your Hellfires and your Defile, obviously, still available to you. So, you know, those are some of the, the uh, useful tools. And then against some of the more... Uh, some of those slower decks, that's where you really want to hit your Mountain Giants. I, I think one of the key things with even Warlock is to know which matchups uh, you want Mountain Giant uh, early and which ones you need to be more defensive, right? So basically yeah. identifying whether you are the more aggressive deck, uh, you know, which is often called the beatdown, or whether you're the con uh, control deck, the one that wants to slow your opponent down uh, in any given scenario. So I think that's one of the key things with even Warlock and how you mulligan in your matchups. Yeah, and, and I mean, I think it helps, like, you know, for like myself, the fact that you've, if, if you've played Handlock in the day, it's similar matchup style. Certain classes, you always mulligan in the Giants a lot of the times. You yeah. know, uh, certain, you know, certain matchups, you're always keeping it. Yeah, and I mean, I, I think um, 
there's a couple examples I think we can we can talk about with uh, when we get to our tip as well about some of the uh, even warlock and how um, you can plan ahead with that as well. And I mean that even comes down to the mulligan, um, yep. you know, down to uh, the, the matchups and, and thinking about that. But we will come back to that when we get to the the tips section. Um, next up on the the decks that we're going to be covering. Um, well, okay, first of all, um, with even warlock, uh, do you, do you do you think like I mean the the legendaries we have here again, Lich King, Blood River, Gul'dan, those are all pretty solid crafts, right? Yeah. Uh, the the epics we have, Doomsayer, Mountain Giant. I mean, I I expect Mountain Giant will probably be a card that's relevant in standard until it gets rotated to Hall of Fame one day. Um, yeah, Mount, I mean, Mountain Giant it fits into very niche kind of decks, right? It literally sure. only really fits into Warlock. I mean, yeah, some okay, other classes fair. try a hand like. Like I think That's Druid fair. and Paladin have tried to have a Druid uh, like a hand based like a hand yeah, size deck druid... hasn't really worked. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No, that's a fair point. Fine. Like I think Mountain Giant, if you play lots of Warlock, is definitely yes. worth crafting. Doomsayer is pretty solid in in most control decks. Uh, yeah, in, sure. in and out of the meta. Um, so I mean I think that's pretty solid. Everything else is just commons and and um, rares. So I think the deck is definitely. Uh, solid to craft. I mean, Blood River Gul'dan, I think, is very powerful um, and definitely worth a craft if you enjoy playing Warlock. And Gen is obviously something you, you'll need for even decks, no matter what you're playing, whether you're playing even Shaman, even Warlock, um, or if you played, like, even Paladin before it got nerfed. And Lich King, <laughs> I mean, Lich King's also just pretty solid. It can fit in, in, in a lot of decks, right? Lich King, yeah, that, that's kind of my... Of, of, like, recent sets, that's kind of the, I think, a good general craft. Yeah, so I think the deck is definitely worth crafting, um, and I think it can get you pretty far uh, on on ladder. Like, um, it, and it's a deck that has enough nuance to it that um, you know you're not going to get bored of it very quickly because uh, there's still quite a lot to learn about how to play. You know, I mean, the yeah. is uh, playing three mana eight eight is great, but um, it's it's always a little bit more complicated than that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously some people would like to just oversimplify it, right? But yeah, yeah. sure. Okay, so uh, that's definitely a deck worth crafting um, if you don't have those cards. Next up, we have Recruit Hunter. Um, so this is a deck that when Cathrina was kind of uh, announced, well, when Cathrina was released, right, um, a lot of people were kind of building these kind of Recruit Hunter decks. A lot of them tended to have cube Sure, without uh, how Master Shaw, I think you could probably just run the second spell breaker, you know, at, at the four drop. Yeah. But, like, um, if you don't have Deathstalker Exile, like, the problem is most counter strategies come now rely on Deathstalker Exile's, like, like, there's no replacement because of how unique it is. Yeah. You know, it's infinite value generating machine. Yeah, it's very much a win condition or a, in some matchups, a, a recovery. 
precondition when you need yeah. to get them. Like, especially now, because with the witch web, that's made such a big difference because of um, the, Rush. the uh, vicious scale hide. Yeah. Well, vicious scale hide specifically, both Rush and Lifesteal. Uh, yeah. That's the key thing. You get to remove something off the board and gain life, which is not something Hunter traditionally has access to. So there's a lot more Lifesteal in the pool generally as well. There's the one yeah. that's two one blood worm or something. Uh, and then it, no blood worm, it's the four mana four four. The five mana four four, yeah. yeah and it's the, the swamp leech, I think. The one mana two one is yes. swamp leech, yeah. yeah. Um, so there's, you know, there's more life still in there. So this is a bit of worship. Obviously, this deck is quite a more expensive craft. Yeah. And uh, and the problem is, it's like cards like King Crush and Katharina, it's very difficult to suggest crafting it for like, yeah. because if this deck becomes bad, those cards are going to be bad, basically, right? Yeah. That's what it boils on. Katharina are 100% definitely only ever for this deck. Uh, yeah. Stalker Rex will be good in most types of decks. Prince Killer Seth is uh, a good option in a, in a lot of classes. Time Master Shaw, I think, has potential in the future, but it's very difficult to say at this point. Um, and Lich King, you know, I mean, we already spoke about Lich King, so that, that's not so much <laughs> issue. But yeah, I mean, even some of the reds in the deck, like Seeping Oozling, is, is never seen play outside of this deck specifically. Um, of and, course, yeah. I mean, the Epic's Charge Devil Saw is also not something you want to craft. <laughs> so yeah. this is definitely a deck that I would only suggest people that have most of the cards and maybe only need to craft one or two things. And ideally, those things should be like Death Talk or Rexar. Um, that is good anyway. I, I suggest trying to find a way to, if you really like this mechanic, trying to find a way to make it work. You can go for some slightly slower options. You, you can theoretically play the deck without Crush, maybe add in something else that can be recruited. Um, you know, you can even go with like the Violet Worm or something like that um, to go with maybe more of a value game plan. But it's definitely not going to be anywhere near as powerful as, as having King Crush for the charge. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is definitely a much more expensive deck. Uh, this is <laughs> roughly the deck I played uh, uh, later this season. Um, I wasn't really playing Guy Frenzy at the time. I think I added it in for like the last couple of games. Um, I, I'm a big fan of it. I had some... The one game I had convinced me, and that was like getting the Stalker Rexar, um, getting the Life Drinker, which is another form of life, <laughs> life steal kind of or health gain you can get from the Stalker Rexar. I got Life Drinker plus uh, Stuntus Ball. So I had a 5 mana 4 4 charger, and then I die a frenzy that in like a fatigue battle with my opponent. So I was playing 5 mana 7 7 chargers that dealt 3 damage to my opponent and gained 3 life. And my opponent could see it immediately after seeing me shuffle that into my deck. So I think I was slightly ahead on fatigue by like one or two cards. And uh, that was basically like the camel that broke my opponent's back. And in that case, my opponent had already as a leader in my hand before I played my Dire Frenzy. So they also um, shuffled like a, uh, it was um, another minion I got from uh, another zombie that I had that I hadn't used that was in my hand. <laughs> that like had adapt. It was the Pterodact, uh, you know, the hatchling thing. I always forget its name. The three mana two two that has adapt. Battle cry adapt. Uh, oh, oh, I, I it was that it. plus yeah. like uh, something for stats. So like I had decent stats, but yeah, anyway. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think there's definitely interesting things and when to use Deathstalker Rex on how to use it, which match up, matchups it's good in. Uh, those are some very interesting kind of uh, things as well with the, like, the nuances around playing this deck. I think it's definitely a very interesting deck to play and a lot of the games play out very differently as well, I, I find. Yeah, so, and also like the thing about it is it's like sometimes, you know, the games become like a lot more aggressive based. Where a lot more, some of us just trying to set up the, the ultimate combos, sort of, right? Yeah, sometimes you, you do manage to kind of, especially if you curve well, which is not easy with this deck. And <laughs> you have to hit Candle Shot or Firefly on one, those are the only real options. Into like Killer Seth, into like Tar Creeper, those are pretty much the only ways to curve, and that's not even that great. But if you do curve well, sometimes you can put on a bit of pressure um, with the hero power, and then you can kind of finish it relatively early with like, you know, an oozling. Uh, and where you get an oozling down and it sticks and it, like it's able to even sometimes value trade or you hit play dead on it, that gets crazy. Yeah, I play say, dead. <laughs> I would say never ever keep play dead in your opening hand though. Like I don't think yeah. even in slow matchups where you have oozling, you keep play dead a lot of the time. Um, I think that in slow matchups when your hand is like okay, I think sometimes you, 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 you keep sometimes we like okay cards if you know what I mean like you'll keep Serenic Chain Gang mainly sometimes um, in, in slower matchups where you know it's kind of just average-ish to have um, but most of the time you, re you really want to you know, okay 
I would definitely keep seeding Usland, for example, especially on the coin. Yeah, for sure. Um, so any other tips? I think you've also been playing a bit of those decks. So any other tips? I mean, I think I maybe missed or, basically, um, I mean, sort of like on a little bit less serious note, make sure you don't draw, uh, you know, charge devil swords and, you, you know, don't draw all the targets that you're trying to yeah. <laughs> to cheat yeah. out. Right? <laughs> I, I think to a certain extent that comes to the mulligan. When I was first playing the deck, I was having really bad success with it because I was drawing all my uh, big drops uh, early on. And I think it's because a lot of the time I was mulliganing too much for the perfect hand. You have to realize, like, you can only have Candle Shot, Firefly, and for the early game, really, and then, like, Talk Reap and Genesis. So sometimes you have to just deal with hero powering on two. Uh, and maybe you'll keep, like, Candle Shot, Talk Reap. Well, I mean, you don't keep Candle Shot, Talk Reap in most matchups. But like sometimes I keep staring at Chang and nothing else, or staring at Chang and candle shot, even though in, in most times the uh, hunter decks you would always mulligan in your four drop if you don't have a two or a three, right? Yeah. Um, so sometimes those are the kind of things you, you need to figure out. Like, um, I'm not saying keep, just always keep things that are not the big things, because I, I think that that definitely isn't an approach that always, always going to work. Um, but it does depend on the matchups. And in the slower matchups, I think a lot of the time you can keep the things that are not the things you want to not draw. <laughs> yeah, you kind of have to be a little <laughs> more careful with the Mali when... Yeah. Yeah, because you, you have to remember all the worst case scenarios. I mean, sometimes yeah. that's when Dia Frenzy comes in, right? I mean, the idea with Dia Frenzy is if you do happen to sometimes draw all the other stuff, if, if you ever stick a devil saw, let's say you you use something oozing and then you play dead, you can then, um, uh, you, well, you, use, you, stick, you play oozing, let's say, and it sticks, or three and it sticks, and then you play dead, and you can die a frenzy, like the beast that comes out, for example, if, if it's like a beast. And that's obviously super powerful, because you put them in your deck, and even then when you're drawing, like, let's say, an eight mana, um, 12, 12, uh, 11, 10, 11. 10, well, it's a 10-10 rush, uh, which is the charge of devil's sword, because die frenzy is plus three plus three. As a so yeah. 10, 10, 10. Um, yeah, I mean, even if you're drawing a game at a 10 10 rush, that's still pretty good. I mean, Charles Devil's was essentially rush, except that it's better than rush in this deck because yeah. maybe you get it from Gathrina uh, or Silver Vanguard, you can still go face. That's one of the other key things. That, yeah, the that's one of the player. reasons why they didn't change it. Though. Yeah. And, I mean, that's that's one of the, the key reasons Charles Devil's was using that. And there's also like a Devil's or Druid deck you can play that uses the quest and uh, cube. Yeah, sure. Uh, that's currently <laughs> not like. Tech, yeah, it's 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 currently not as uh, I think as competitive though. It's a thing though. Yeah, but... it's definitely in the lower tiers of druid decks as well. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, yeah. Um, okay, so uh, maybe we will return to this thing. We'll definitely talk a little bit more about even more when we get to our tip uh, for the week. Um, the last piece of news is that the Jewish Church Champion is, is now live. Um, I, I, I always await the, the deck lists before I <laughs> look at what, who, who I think might um, be the champion. I, I don't really want to predict based purely on the names, um, even though uh, I might have a favorite player and that might influence my decision making once I, let's say, think that these are the top four lineups that might pick my favorite player from there. But um, we've done it before, um, done it before with Scythe, and we've done it, I think, before as well, yeah, um, where we do so. like a full analysis. Uh, set over a spreadsheet and calculate who we think is going to make it, uh, what the lineups are, how the matchups are going to go. We look through like every game in the group stage, predict them, uh, and then, you know, it, it's kind of like uh, if you've done like a World Cup record prediction for the, for the, the football World Cup going on now, it's like that, except um, we probably spend a lot more time on it than anyone spent on the World Cup record predictions. And also, so some of the pros, okay, important thing to keep out, some pros on Twitter, they actually, I think last time it was like Ant and some guys, where they actually literally played through like exact lineups and basically like simulated yeah. the brackets. They yeah, took it I like, mean, that's like, that's like next level though, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's definitely an approach you can take, but obviously that's, like we're looking at it from a theoretical, like analytical Statistical point, yeah. Yeah, statistical point rather than actually playing things. Experiment, out, which, yeah, exactly. Sometimes when decks are really wacky, that, that doesn't prove something you can do, but we'll have to see when the data's come out. So um, make sure you keep tuned to the, to the YouTube channel for that when that comes out, um, and to my Twitter as well, and I'm sure Panama as well, if he does join me for that, uh, depending on schedules, but hopefully he will. Um, but some people aren't like me and don't wait for all the necklaces. Some people <laughs> got the gun to pick their champion. Don't take that 
Yeah, so <laughs> I usually, but like this time, I literally, I just went, I, I just quickly, briefly looked at all the players. I was like, oh, I like Doug. Okay, Doug. <laughs> so I think a lot of, I think because he's he's actually one of like the few sort of relatively well-known players in this uh, summer championships, it's a lot of these names are a lot less familiar or, you know, not as popular. So also like, uh, yeah. yeah, Doug, Doug is one of my favorite players. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, same for me. I mean, if he is, if he, if our predictions have him anywhere near the like top four, I'd probably just vote for him. Like that, that's kind of what it comes down to. I think for me, it's like narrowing. Who, like, I want to not make the mistake of voting for somebody that has really unfavored matchups in their group, for example. Those are the key things I look at. Like, who's going to get out of their group? Uh, yeah. And then you know maybe like how because the further you go, the more risk, like the more unreliable your predictions become because you have yeah. you don't know who they're actually going to face up against because one you know one match in a group stage can affect the rest of the whole bracket. I mean that's that's always how these things go. So uh, I, that, that's an important thing to notice. So I just kind of want to look at the lineups overall and, and all that kind of stuff. So once we get the lineups, we will definitely go ahead and, and do that kind of analysis and, and have a look. Um, I can't but help feel sorry for. I remember was it the last championship with Jason Zhao. I uh, think he yeah. like he he where he was in a bracket where he made like so I think his his meta read was good if he was any in any other group, but he happened to be in the one group where literally he was like unfavored. I think in nearly all of his games. Yeah, and, and that's that's the tough thing. Like sometimes uh, if you're really good, they can just have the unfortunate lineup for the group and something. And, uh, yeah. and those are the, the key things that I, I generally want to avoid with my future champion. Um, the future champion does close uh, exactly a week from now from the recording of this podcast. So it closes on the 27th uh, of June. Um, so we will definitely have it out uh, plenty before then. Uh, and hopefully we will all remember to vote. I mean, obviously, California has already, but I have a terrible tendency of forgetting to vote before <laughs> the time, much like I did with HGG. It feels bad, man. Um, mm. Yeah, so, okay. Now on to the tip we've been speaking about. Uh, so that's the whole new section done. So now we're going to be talking about the Magma Rages tip to keep you from raging. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about planning ahead. Uh, just generally, um, there's a couple of elements to planning ahead. Uh, what we mean by this is just, uh, you know, not only looking at the immediate turn and what's the best um, way, what's the best play this turn, but what's the best play uh, for all of my turns going forward? How are we going to set up the rest of the turns? And one of the, the key issues with that is curve, right? Yeah. So the thing about this is, especially when it comes to, you know, the first thing a lot of new players learn is obviously, you know, if I have something that costs one, I want to play it on turn one, two, two mana, cost two. And a lot of times, you know, that's kind of, that for, for a while, that's that's obviously quite a good rule to follow, uh, you know, while you're still in the game and the mechanics. But I think, like, as you go longer, you then got to start assessing, okay, but, like, these cards that I'm playing, are they, are they most impactful and most useful when I'm playing them now? So, like, just because the, the card costs two mana, is it best? used and is it optimally used might be played on turn two right and yeah. certain cards you know like i love cards of spring time where that's not actually always the case where even though it costs two or three mana you might actually want to save it till later in the game yeah i think uh, a good example with that i don't know if you necessarily agree with me on that, the example would be um, I, I think even warlock generally has a lot of good examples for that one of the ones that says hellfire so generally you know board players he wants mm. to time them right but it gets it, sometimes in, in like certain aggro matchups hellfire on four is very tempting okay? very often the board is in a good state to hellfire on four uh, and sometimes you need to know like in a, in a given matchup it, is it a deck full of like hellfire targets is it a deck where there aren't that many hellfire targets if i can use hellfire or defile which do i use um you yeah. know all these kind of things and one of the key things with planning ahead is knowing your opponent's deck so uh, having more knowledge about the meta, the other decks, even if you don't enjoy playing the deck, just having more knowledge about the common uh, cards in the deck really helps because it helps you predict what your opponent's going to do. And when yeah. we talk about planning ahead, you know, once again, we're not just talking about this turn, we're talking about like, what do I do uh, after my opponent's next turn? So let's say I clear the board now, let's say I play Hellfire on 4, and then they just develop again and I'm in the same position where, oh, now I need to clear the board again. Um, so maybe it's better for me to play a Twilight Trek so that I 
can get trades and then Hellfire the turn after and get head on board uh, in like two turns of time, right? So yeah, I think those are some of the, the kind of key uh, things to recognize when it comes to like playing ahead. Yeah, it comes to yeah playing playing ahead. Uh, you know, and like it's okay, like you said, it's just the the easiest way really. I think it's just to read up on different decks, and if you your collection supports, you know, supports to try and even play, like you say, even if you don't enjoy it, try and learn to play the deck, just so you understand the way the deck, and you also understand what how each deck curves. So like you understand that this deck, what this deck wants to do on turn one, two, three, four, five, then you know the different decks obviously do different things at different turns, obviously. Yeah, I think another one of the great examples of planning ahead, uh, and even more luck, is Mountain Giant. Um, yes. Mountain Giant is another great example as well of uh, not necessarily playing on curve. So sometimes, you know, on turn two, it might be better for you to hero power, so that you can play your giant on three if you're on the coin, for instance. Uh, whereas uh, you always have to kind of keep with Mountain Giant because its mana cost is reduced by the number of other cards in your hand. You need to keep an idea of that and how that's going to affect its mana cost going forward. Um, there's a lot of planning ahead generally, I would say, in, in even Warlock when you tap, when you don't. Um, and another one of the, uh, well, actually, let's just talk more about Mountain Giant, right? So let's say it's a slower matchup, um, and I, I let's have four money again. Um, so a lot of the times in slower matchups with even Warlock, you would want to like money get away cards like Shroom, Brewer, maybe Spellbreaker. You literally only want giants. You almost full mul for you almost full like in slow matchups. You almost full mulling for mountain giants and sometimes tw and twilight tricks, basically. Yeah, the exception is the mirror, but I will get to the interesting play in the mirror in a second. Or once we're, we're done talking about mountain giants specifically, um, and yeah, so you want the, the mountain giants. So let's say I full mulligan. Now I get a mountain giant and a plated beetle with my opening hand along with some other cards. So I tap on one. Now it might be instinctive to play plated beetle on two. But I have to realize that that's going to, you know, I'm, let's have the coin, right? I have to realize that's going to stop me from playing Mountain the Giant. Turn two three, and that's the key turn. It's not playing the better deal now, it's playing the Mountain Giant on turn three. And sometimes, even if your opponent plays something that you want to be able to contest with the plated deal, you need to realize, like, if I play the plated deal here, when do I ever get to play the Mountain Giant? When do, does the mana cost ever align? Is it maybe better for me to take a little bit of damage here? Yeah. Uh, in order to uh, get this mountain giant down and then be, use it to fight it for the board. Um, so, yeah. You know, those are kind of key things. Whereas in, like, just to sort of, just to con contrast that against, let's say, Odd Paladin, for example, most, the majority of the times, you'll play the play to beat on turn two, even if you have the giant on the coin. Yeah. Because the giants, it's not worth, like, their domain, you, you got to understand that matchup is about staying alive. You know, and yeah. that's that's why, you know, knowing the different decks, knowing the different win conditions and knowing when is keeping life important or when is life just a, a resource you can, you know, use quite freely, that that's quite key a lot of the times. Yeah, definitely. Um, one of the other interesting parts uh, that when it comes to planning ahead is also the spell stone. So well, before that, uh, if you want to just talk about the, the play in the mirror. Uh, I'm assuming okay, it's going to involve okay, Doomsayer, okay. right? Yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, spoilers. Uh, okay, oh. so, so the interesting thing in uh, Warlock Mirrors is because the, uh, even Warlock Mirrors specifically, um, because the player on the coin can play Mountain Giants on three because they have that extra card in their hand between the coin uh, and the player on the play uh, can uh, only play Mountain Giants on turn four. Um, the interesting thing is that on t very often on turn two, uh, going against your um, even Warlock opponent that has a coin, you want to play Doomsayer. So Doomsayer is actually almost more important in the matchup sometimes than Giants because playing a Doomsayer and then following up with your own Giants is so crucial in the even Warlock mirrors. I have yeah. one of the last games purely based on that. We both have Giants, but who has the Doomsayer is the question. And setting that up, right, that's a case of how do I play this here, even though it doesn't look good on the board now because they don't have anything on the board. It's stopping I, the, yeah. Yeah, it's stopping their next turn. And that sets you up better for your next turn because you weren't able to play your own giant uh, yet, but they were going to get down the giant first. And uh, in the mirrors, this is once again a traditional handlock throwback. Uh, playing the first giant is super important um, because you get the initiative with it. You get to yeah. decide whether the giant goes face or whether it trades. <laughs> exactly, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And that's also so, where, you know, cards like Sun Fury Protector can be pretty good as well. Sometimes, even if you didn't have the initiative, you might be able to go 
like faced with the giant the first time because you can use some fear protector on this. I mean, yeah. I've had games like that where I've, uh, my opponent played the giant first, they hit face, and then like I play my giant, or I'm sorry, yeah, I play, I play giant, I play giant, they hit face, and then I play like second giant and just call me some fear protector or something like that, some fear protector on the giant, and then like all of a sudden they're like, ah, okay, now I have to train the giants, and then <laughs> you kind of get, you kind of understand that, right? And, and, yeah. and that's the key thing as well with the whole giant uh, interactions in the mirror. It, it's about planning ahead. It's about where is my opponent going to attack with the giant next turn. So you've got to think about your opponent's attacks next turn and your attacks and, and how you can um, manipulate those to be in the best state when it becomes your turn again. Yeah, exactly. And then, yeah, okay. The other card that is obvious um, uh, that you, you need to set up over multiple turns uh, in the deck is the spell stone. I mean, that's true with most of the spell stones. Uh, if you're playing a recruit hunter version with the secrets of the spell stone, that's uh, very important in that deck as well, because you still want to play spell stone on five. Um, in that deck, ideally, if you can get three to four uh, walls, um, sometimes even two is enough. And, and in this deck, it's a, it's a case of how big a spell stone do I need for how much life steal do I need? What are the key things? Uh, sorry, that I need to remove with the spell stone, and how am I going to get to being able to play the spell stone when I need to play it um, for the amount of damage that I need, right? So sometimes you might play Vogel on Monculus on turn three, let's say, uh, overplaying a plated beetle because you need to activate your spell stone to kill their uh, five mana um, uh, drop that they play or five health drop that they play on turn four or something like that, right? You know, these are the, the key interesting things um, that you also need to think about with, with, with spellstones, and it's one of the things I actually really like about spellstones. Okay. Yeah, um, so I think, I mean, I think we've talked a lot about planning, so I think, uh, I think that's, yeah. uh, I mean, I think given people a lot of ideas and a lot to think about, I think. Yeah. And um, the other one thing to talk about uh, with planning is just even on podcast index have introduced a, a lot of interesting um kind of nuances to planning because it, it, especially with curving you don't curve out naturally one two three four you know but you go out with these funky uh, how you use your hero power and um, how, how you use your different cards like which four drops are better on five and which are better on four you know all those kind of things it's also an interesting thing to to look at and how you can use them uh, what cards are make good combinations to kind of help you get around it what what you want to tap and what at the same time in let's say even more work. So I think even an odd cost text have introduced an, an interesting um, nuance to that whole uh, issue of planning ahead as well. Yeah. Uh, and then finally, uh, we have uh, the esports that's happened over the last two weekends basically. Uh, first off, we had HTT Seoul, which was won by Hunter Ace. It was a massive event. Um, which had a really weird structure where like the global players were separated from the uh, yeah. Korean players and then there was another separation I believe with the like APAC players or something. Yeah, like they had a, and then there were there was some controversy because they released a balance patch without uh, uh, yeah, with yeah. the question and then they, they allowed only the people who had question to resubmit and it was caused the whole big stir. Yeah, but, that's kind of uh, a Blizzard uh, mix up as well, rather than yeah. only HTTC. Also, uh, I think you know Blizzard and their, their like esports team, which is you know, directly associated with Blizzard themselves, got a little bit involved in that as well in terms of uh, uh, and stuff. Ultimately, the the quest druid wasn't that much of a, an issue, but the um, the Magos druid was pretty powerful. Uh, Strength beating out Samuel Sao in the the final there it was actually great to see. Samuel Sal doing well again, uh, even though there was a lot of controversy about his plays as well, a lot of um, pros disagreeing with a lot of the, the lines and decisions that he made. Um, but I mean, yeah, at, at a certain point, uh, when he's putting up enough consistent results, maybe we need to like look at why he's making them rather than people necessarily criticizing him. I don't know. It's kind yeah. of an interesting situation. Yeah, it's also. It's always difficult, especially in heart. I mean, you know, it's always it's always easy to be an armchair critic, right? But like, it's it's all about also, you know, people's mindsets at at, at sort of the, the the top level, and in certain situations, like yeah. I can even tell just from like some of my personal experiences. Sometimes your mind, you're so fixated on a certain idea or a certain play or something, you will literally overlook something that's so blatant that 
you know, on any other day, it was so blatantly obvious because you're so like sort of zoomed in and focused on that one concept or one yeah, point. The, the one kind of game plan for a match. Exactly. Like, yeah. you know, for, like, I think that happened. I don't remember if it was somebody, somebody missed lethal, I think, in some situation because they literally weren't like looking for the lethal. I think it was an ACT stop. But something silly like that. Um, because they're worried about trying to stop lethal. They're, they're, they're too busy in a, a passive mindset yeah, instead of going, wait, how much damage do I have on board? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think uh, the other interesting thing is the other top four players that fill up the top four, which is Sane and Stilo. Uh, Stilo is one of the players that's going to be representing Korea in the HTG team. Yeah. Um, so that's good for Korea to have a, a local player do well at their, their ACT event. Um, and just Sane is obviously an American player. So we have like an American player, a European player, um, a Korean player, and then like an APAC player basically. Um, yeah. In the, in the top four, which is a good split of representation at that event, at least in, in terms of the, the finals. Um, so, you know, that, that's also good to see. Uh, and then there was also the following weekend after that was DreamHack <laughs> Summer. Yeah. Um, kind of one of the, the biggest DreamHack events um, in terms of like the DreamHack Summer and we talk kind of the, uh, in Jönköping, uh, in Sweden, or like the. Uh, they're the, the places where the flagship Dreamhack events. was founded, right? That, that's what Flag, they're, the they're flagship like the, the home of DreamHack, that's kind of yeah. what I'm saying. Um, where he, yeah, it was uh, founded in Sweden back in the day. Anyway, um, so we had Fury Hunter coming up against Penadani in the um, in the grand finals. Uh, I was interested to see Penadani there, cast a bunch of him last um, season of ESL Southeast European Championships. Um, so, you know, it was good to see him uh, kind of making the step up to doing so well at DreamHack. Uh, Fury Hunter uh, managed to take away the win there. Uh, Lots of player. upsets, though. Like, I, I was looking yeah. at the top 16 bracket and the fact that I think it was Pena Hadani who actually... Uh, yeah, he, had a, he had a crazy run in the... Like, in like he, he took down Muzzy. Yeah, Muzzy, a.k.a. And, and, and Green Sheep. And Green Sheep. Like, like three <laughs> relatively well-known... I think, uh, I mean, what? All of those players have basically gone to the World Championships, except Mazi. No, who's... I don't think Green Sheep has. Green Sheep has. He was in the first one. Yeah, Green Sheep was. Okay. was, one a, was... Played at the World Championships. Hasn't he? Like no, was he like so. seasonal? Yeah, seasonal. But they, okay. it doesn't matter. They're all yeah. like well-known players that are like top players. I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, if you're going to beat Show, it's good to see Show kind of well, take you in. <laughs> no, I haven't, I haven't seen him for a while. It is in his home country of Sweden, so that probably helps a lot. Um, yeah. But yeah, it was good to see him taking part in tournaments. Actually, Green Ship as well was a story I was really happy to see how far he got, because I know like he's been a lot more dejected in more recent times because he really has been struggling for tournament performances outside of like UK tournaments. Yeah. Um, so I think that was that was good to see as well. Uh, so yeah, uh, congrats to, to Fury Hunter on the win there. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's all we have for the international esports side of things. Um, there is an event coming up in Pretoria that we mentioned a little bit earlier in the show, uh, Rush, which is an, uh, um, an event that we were both at last year. Um, yeah. That we had the ESL Africa, the season one um, finals that kind of, well, we cast from there, at least um, Penguin and myself. And, uh, you know, I also kind of played in the, the side event that they had there. Uh, this year, it's going to be a bit different. It's not East South Africa or quite um, They're going to be running a tavern. Nibble uh, Esports is going to be running a, a yeah. tavern ball cup. Yeah, do you want to tell the, the viewers a little bit more about it? So, from what I understand, it's basically, it's going to be, so it's going to be the tavern, bro- it's basically going to be a, a more casual event. So it's a tavern brawl. Yeah. It's going to be best of one double elimination. Uh and so basically, there's going to be, I think, uh, if you can post like the, the links to the yeah. website to sign up. Yeah, it's, it's basically, uh, Rush is from the 29th to the 1st of July. Yeah. But the event is on the Saturday, which I think is the 30th of June? Uh, yeah, it's Saturday. The 30th. The 30th. Yeah, the 30th, yeah, 30th of June. And if you sign up before the 25th of June, you get a free, you get free ticket entry to the event for the whole weekend. So like... I, I encourage whether you a new player or veteran, you know, if you're not busy that Saturday, you know, go through. It's in Pretoria. It's at, uh, I think it's called Sun Square. Um, 
that's 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 your uh, neighborhood. Uh, it's uh, I can t- I'll tell you, it's at the Sun Arena at Times okay. Square, Pretoria. That's it. Yeah, sorry, I was mixing. Yeah, so twenty nine to the first June. I mean, if you do you want to check, there's a whole bunch of other events happening as well. So check yeah. out RussianSports.ca.za. But yeah, uh, yeah. there's uh, Fortnite Mobile one v one tournament going on. Yeah, there's Bang well. Glory. Uh, there's Bang Quake Glory, Champions. There's, yeah, there's CS:GO and Dota. Uh, Street Fighter even. I actually don't know about the Dota, but I know there's CS:GO happening there. Definitely. Yeah, there's Tekken. There's Street Fighter. So there's a whole bunch of mm-hmm. different, you know, games for different tastes. So, yeah, I yeah. think there's some FIFA going on as well. I, I think the, the ACGL guys are hosting. So you're going to come up for the FIFA, Dub? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I would if, you know, it wasn't in Pretoria. Uh, but before <laughs> everyone from Pretoria hates me. Um, yeah, no, unfortunately, I'm, I'm not going to be coming up this year. But uh, are you going to be there for the for Rush? Uh, I have I have some other commitments, but uh, I want to see maybe if I can still go, pop, uh, go through and see how things are. But yeah, I'm not sure as of yet. Yeah. Um, yeah, once again, I mean, if you haven't played any tournaments, um, this is obviously not a, you know, some serious constructed tournament, it is focused on having fun introducing people to Hearthstone. Uh, you can also just go and, you know, chat to people about Hearthstone and find out more about the fireside gatherings that do happen up in uh, Jogo and Victoria as well. That, um, you know, uh, I'm sure the people there can also give you lots more info about that, or you can always contact uh, Pandemonium there over on uh, Twitter. Um, yeah, but definitely go ahead and support if you can. Um, and, you know, if you're also interested in Tavern Balls, uh, they have um, uh, some of the guys that are, well, uh, Game of Thrones now with uh, Noble uh, Esports, he's been running a lot of the Tavern Brawl yeah. like, tournaments, you know, on Thursday evenings. Uh, you know, check out the, if you're a South African, check out the Hustle and South Africa Facebook group for that um, to, to join in on those as well. Otherwise, yeah, you can, uh, get down to Rush and join up there and, you know, just chat to people, see, see how it all is. And, um, yeah, I mean, I'm sad to not be going to Rush as an event as a whole. Uh, I, I would have, it would be cool. You know, like, I, I like esports outside of just hot zone as well. I enjoy watching a lot of um, esports, so it would have definitely been interesting to go to, but, yeah, unfortunately in the wrong area for me. So that is all we have for this week. Uh, as promised, it was a longer episode again with some more consider or uh, more content around decks and we'll be back again next week uh, with more decks and um, hopefully more stuff discussion about the meta I think as well because yeah. I mean we didn't actually really talk much about how diverse this meta is currently yeah that's true I mean I, I think we were, we were focused a little bit on, on the decks more than the, the meta itself I mean it is a very very diverse meta but I uh, come back next week to hear us talk about that and if you have any specific <laughs> deck suggestions you want us to check out um Yeah.